So that was the, the climax. Uh, <laughs> now, now for the denouement. Um, freedom and nature, uh, limitation is liberation. So I'll just jump right in. <clears throat> in sections 32 and 33 of Veritatis Splendor, the encyclical published 25 years after Humanae Vitae, John Paul II took critical aim at a conception of freedom that emerged in the modern era. Uh, and now uh, he claims threatens to undermine human nature. This conception has two characteristics that uh, seem initially uh, so opposed as to be mutually exclusive. On the one hand, freedom, uh, he says, has been exaggerated beyond all human proportion so that it trumps at every turn any limitation, anything that would give it context and therefore order and intelligibility. So says section 32. On the other hand, section 33 worries that freedom has shrunk to the point of vanishing, giving way in the modern imagination to determinisms of various sorts, which are familiar, I think, to all of us uh, in their scientific, psychological, historical, and economic forms. Now, I'm going to argue that however opposed these tendencies appear to be, so the uh, tendency to absolutize freedom on the one hand and to uh, eliminate it on the other, they're actually logically inseparable from each other. Uh, they're flip sides of the same coin. That coin is a conception of nature that has come to dominate the contemporary worldview, namely a, con a conception that isolates nature from freedom and vice versa in the manner that John Paul II uh, describes in sections 46 through uh, 50 of VS. When the Pope wrote uh, Veritate Splendor, he was, of course, seeking to address the general loss of a moral compass in the modern world, the relativizing of all norms, norms which were once recognized as absolute and without exception, to the point um, of submerging the whole of human consciousness in the gray twilight of pure imminence. But there's good reason to think that he had Humani Vitae especially in mind, as has been mentioned many times uh, here, not only because sexual matters represent an especially important realm um, of morality, but more fundamentally because the problem posed by contraception brings into play what is arguably the paradigmatic expression of the relationship between nature and freedom. And uh, that's the relation that underlies every uh, moral problem in a certain sense uh, in the end. Indeed, we can go further. The matter discussed in Humanae Vitae implicates the very principle that underlies our understanding of the nature of reality simply, and so of the creator of that reality, the nature of God, and so of God's redemptive act embodied in the church and her sacraments. It's not, therefore, an accident that the issue of contraception has been and continues to be, as I think we all recognize, something of a litmus test. Refusal of the church's traditional teaching on this matter almost always uh, coincides with not only a rejection of some point or other in the church's teaching, but with a general sense that uh, church teaching or orthodoxy um, does not really matter that much in the end. Those things always seem to go together. And the classical tradition, the concept of nature indicated more than simply the collection of things that are as yet untouched by human artifice. It represented instead the essence that defines things. This definitive essence was not just a concept, a category of reason that would allow us to classify the individual items that constitute the world, but most fun fundamentally, uh, it's an ontological reality, a principle internal to things, which allowed things to flourish as the things they are, and only thus to be able to be classified according to certain types, so species. According to Aristotle, nature is an internal principle of motion and rest. A frog moves because it is trying to be a frog, which is to say, to fulfill its nature. And the movement that constitutes its natural activity is not aimless, but has a destination, which is why the very same thing that makes it a principle of motion makes it a, a principle of rest. To say that nature is teleo uh, teleological is therefore a tautology. It's just to say that nature is natural. Now, because nature is an internal principle of motion and rest, life represents a culminating expression of nature. When self, while self-accomplishing activity is not immediately evident, perhaps, in water or stone, it is unmistakable in a frog. A frog is not just a product of nature, but it itself natures, so to speak, which is to say it actively participates 
in what it is. It carries out actions that enable it to be what it is as the subject, uh, the source of those actions. Among its various activities, there is one that stands out from the others as displaying a unique quality. While eating and sleeping, for example, are activities that serve the animal's existence as an individually existing thing, generation is an activity that can be said to serve its nature in a supra-individual sense, which is incidentally why it takes more than one frog to accomplish it. In the act of reproduction, the frog simultaneously serves itself as an individual, and it serves its individual transcending species. It's not just the frog, then, that reproduces, uh, but life itself. Or in other words, the frog is here acting as an agent of life. Even more basically, it is acting as an agent of nature, which, of course, has an etymological connection to birth, natus uh, natura. <clears throat> the same thing can be said regarding man. In the generative act, man and woman act as agents of life. They are, to be sure, actively, indeed personally, involved. Uh, they're not mere passive functionaries of a higher cause. In other words, uh, they are here not only natura naturata, to use Spinoza's language, but at the very same time, natura naturans, a naturing nature. On the other hand, however, they're involved in a manner that is more than personal. The act occurs at a depth beyond any individual self-interest and cannot be made simply an object of deliberate intention. In the sexual union, the man and woman are taken up into an activity that exceeds them as individuals. The ecstatic character that uh, Adrian Walker spoke so beautifully about this morning, the ecstatic character of the sexual act is a kind of existential expression of this ontological truth. So a moment ago, I described the generative activity of the frog like, likewise as a supra-individual activity. And of course, there's a deep analogy between human procreation and the reproduction of other animals. But the human act is unique in two respects. Alone among the animals, man possesses spiritual freedom. When he's taken up into this activity, he's taken up as a free individual. And so in a manner that includes his deliberate choices. More bro broadly speaking, it includes all the height and depth of human creativity. Sexual union in man is not only a natural act, but at the same time a personal act and a cultural act. Second, as the classical tradition has it, man is not just one among the many things in nature, but in a certain uh, respect represents nature. Standing as he does at the point of interaction, uh, intersection between the material world and the spiritual world, recapitulating material creation in himself and opening it up to spiritual meaning, man is microcosmos, a recapitulation of nature in himself. So in this respect, he's, he does not act only as an agent of nature, but uh, uh, as a representative of nature, stands for it. It's against this background, I think, that we can see the profound drama involved in man's sexual union. Deeper, of course, than the conscious awareness of the agents involved. This is why it's a mystery of its very essence. Ancient cultures celebrated marriage not just as a union between two individuals, and not even just as a union, as we often hear, between two families or uh, family lines, uh, but they celebrated as a, a union between heaven and earth. The complex liturgy, the pageantry, and the celebration that's, that surrounds the per particular moment of instantiation and extends in both directions for days on end manifests a sense of the cosmological significance of this reality. While the mythological character of all this needs to be qualified, as I will suggest in a moment, there remains a profound truth in this primitive uh, uh, cultural presentation. Nature itself comes to a culminating expression here, as we suggested. Nature itself is at, state, is at stake in human procreation. Man's creative involvement, his exercise of freedom in this activity is therefore, in addition to everything else, an encounter with the meaning of nature to court. It is for this reason that I said that the sexual union between man and woman is a paradigm of the relationship between nature and freedom. So why should this matter? What's at stake? What, signi what significance does nature have in human sexual activity? Let me explain. Uh, in 1956, 
uh, the cultural anthropologist Mircea Eliade, uh, a name you don't hear so much anymore, but uh, for, for a time he was a popular uh, writer. Eliade wrote a groundbreaking book called The Sacred and the Profane, in which he explained the essential role of the sacred in ancient human cultures. Um, to quote some passages from the book's opening pages, so just a string of passages from, I think, the first three pages here. Um, he writes, for religious men, space is not homogeneous. He experiences interruptions, breaks in it. Some parts of space are qualitatively different from others. This spatial non-homogeneity finds expression in the opposition, sorry, in the experience of an opposition between space that is sacred, the only real and really existing space, and all other space, the formless expanse surrounding it. It is the break effected in space that allows the world to be constituted because it reveals the fixed point, the central axis for all future orientation. When the sacred manifests itself in any hierophany, there is the revelation of an absolute reality opposed to the non-reality of the vast surrounding expanse. The manifestation of the sacred ontologically founds the world. If the world is to be lived in, it must be founded, and no world can come to birth in the chaos of the homogeneity and relativity of profane space. The discovery or projection of a fixed point, the center, is equivalent to the creation of the world. End of the quotations. So Eliade is, say, Eliade is saying here that we have a world properly speaking uh, and he's talking about primitive cultures here, um, only if there is some point of reference that transcends the flux of changing conditions as an absolute to which uh, all other things are relative and from which all things precisely in their relativity receive their meaning. <clears throat> now, it's common to present the religiously founded cosmos that Eliade describes as a fruit of mythology and thus as something that belonged to primitive man qua primitive. Christian revelation, it is said then, cleared the mists of the divine from the cosmos by recognizing as holy only the personal God who created, not through some natural process, but in freedom, and so who infinitely transcends the world. This is the response typically. The absolute that has entered history here in Christianity is not some natural object now deified, not sacred space, but it is God himself in the free person, Jesus Christ. What I wish to propose in contrast to this judgment is that Christian revelation did not eliminate the depth dimension of the religiously founded cosmos that Eliade describes, but further differentiated it and placed it on a more rational foundation. Specifically, and this is a basic thesis of my paper here, what takes the place of some fetishized natural object in the, uh, uh, for the pre-Christian world is in the Christian cosmos, the concept of nature itself. The concept of nature itself. Nature as a divinely sanctioned logos. So in the Christian world, it is the concept of nature that is the absolute, to which all the creativity of human culture is relative, though it is relative not in the manner of unilateral subjection, but as I'll explain in a moment, in a manner that uh, frees it to be genuinely creative. Just as the sacred object effected a world-founding break in physical space in ancient cultures, nature affects a world-founding break, you might say, in intellectual space or with respect to the practical order in the space of our freedom, which is essential if that space is to have an intelligible shape. So uh, the concept of nature represents um, a break in the homogeneity of our thinking, the givenness of nature. And it's that sort of uh, absoluteness that is absolutely required for us to have any um, ordered thinking. And then something analysis can be said about action. Without the presence of what is absolute, which is essential of that space, uh, so without the presence of what is absolute, which introduces a point of reference 
beyond our deliberate choices and thus provides a horizon within which human action and its intelligibility unfold, existence becomes an undifferentiated continuum without any real distinction between the meaningful and the meaningless. When Veritatis Splendor in insists on exceptionless norms, it is not only offering needed moral guidance in areas of supreme importance, it is also bearing witness to the absoluteness of nature. And so the discontinuous presence that allows real eros, real human drama, real nobility, in short, the real, tout court, to give order to existence. It bears witness to what allows cultural form and a meaningful life. It's just this absoluteness of nature that presents itself to our freedom and calls us to decision in the way we live our marital unity. Now, what does it mean to absolutize nature? That should disturb you a little bit. Um, did I not distinguish man from frog earlier by saying that the frog is bounded by nature in a way that man is not? Doesn't this imply that man's essence is not to absolutize nature? We saw this point made in the majority report uh, discussed uh, earlier. Is not freedom precisely a power to transcend nature, a power that God gave man as a gift, making man alone in the image of God, of the God who freely created nature? Is this not why he gave man alone dominion over the natural world? The answer to these questions is, of course, yes, but absolutely everything turns on how we understand that answer. Accepting that freedom is a power to transcend what is given by nature, there remain two basic ways one can conceive this transcendence and the relation it implies between freedom and nature. As V.S. explains, we can either think of nature and freedom as extrinsic to one another, such that nature stands for everything that lies outside of freedom as a pre-moral quantity, uh, as it says, uh, and freedom, in this case, represents a power that acts on nature, likewise from the outside, perhaps taking nature as a necessary presupposition for its action, but nothing more. Or we can recognize freedom and nature as intrinsic to each other from the beginning. The former view is inevitably nihilistic. The latter, by contrast, is the Christian, I propose, and indeed the only genuinely human view. To get at the difference, I want to refer to an observation made by the great Catholic philosopher Robert Speymann, who's been mentioned already. In an essay from 1973, Speymann contrasts a primitive, unmediated, and crude sense of nature uh, as something set over against human freedom and culture as its simple opposite to what he characterizes as the classical teleological sense of nature, which is open in itself to integration within higher contexts of meaning. In the first case, freedom acts on nature from the outside, as it were, exerting its power over nature without any essential regard for what nature might mean in itself. Paradoxically, this essentially violent relation to nature, he explains, entails a dialectic by which freedom inevitably gets reduced back in turn to the crude nature it acts upon. I'll come back to that point uh, in a moment. In the second case, the more ample case, uh, understanding, freedom acts from within the given meaning of nature and does so from its origin. In this case, Speymann says, freedom does not transcend nature except by recollecting it, taking it up in its integrity. This is what it would mean to speak of nature, uh, I suggest, as absolute. Not that it cannot be transcended in freedom, but that it remains, even in freedom's transcendence, as a point of reference, and in fact gets deepened rather than left behind. To absolutize nature in this context is to recognize it as transcending every other element in the order of human action, as the fixed center that constitutes that order. In other words, uh, it's not to reduce everything to the natural in a totalitarian, totalitarian way, but to preserve the meaning of nature in any and every context so that it remains an indissoluble reference point, even when taken up into a higher context. Speymann claims that it is, in fact, only if we recollect nature in the end that we can transcend it. Okay, so all that sounds very abstract. To illustrate, Speymann refers in passing to uh, what I think is one of the most remarkable little exchanges in ancient philosophy, and this is the uh, debate between Socrates, the philosopher, and Thrasymachus, the notorious sophist, um, which takes place in the opening book of Plato's Republic. It's worth dwelling on this scene a bit longer than Speymann himself does. He refers to it in passing. So the two men in Plato's dialogue here are discussing what it means to rule, which is an exercise of freedom, right? Uh, what it means to rule, or in other words, to have power over. 
Thrasymachus is defending what he takes to be the common opinion, namely that the one who has power over something has the ability to do what he wishes with it and get what he wants from it. We can hear in this the popular conception of freedom uh, that dominates in our age. Socrates, by contrast, takes the very paradoxical view that it is the very essence of power to serve that over which it has power. It's crucial to note that Socrates is not making a moral point here, but an ontological one. So he's not saying that power, which in itself is defined as the ability to do whatever one wishes, ought to be used to serve. This would presuppose an extrinsic relationship between freedom and nature. Instead, he's saying that service is the defining essence of power. To show this, he takes the humble but beautiful example of the shepherd, who is defined by the task of ruling over sheep. What is the shepherd's aim? His aim, Socrates says, whether he is consciously intending it or not, is flourishing sheep, because that is what defines the activity of shepherding, the power to shepherd. His exercise of this power is more genuinely effective the happier the sheep are. Thrasymachus' response to Socrates' characterization is predictable, even, no doubt, for those unfamiliar with the text. With derision, Thrasymachus dismisses Socrates as naive, as cynically playing stupid, since it is obvious to everyone that the shepherd is actually fattening sheep, not for their own sake, but for the butcher. His aim is not happy sheep, ultimately, but well-seasoned and cooked lamb. The point of difference between Socrates and Thrasymachus, or let us say between philosophy and sophistry, is a subtle one. It may seem too simple to be very significant. But as Socrates goes on to suggest, the very meaning of existence lies in the balance here, in this little point about the sheep and the shepherd. Socrates is not disputing the fact that the shepherd hopes to sell his sheep to the butcher and perhaps make a bundle in doing so that the butcher will in turn chop the meat up and sell it to the chef and so on. His point is that the activity that defines him as a shepherd is service of the ends that constitute the life of the sheep. A shepherd who is actually a butcher would be a failure as a shepherd. Both Socrates and Thrasymachus recognize that the sheep are destined for human consumption. So they both agree on that point and that the shepherd would not be raising the animals otherwise. Or in other words, that the sheep will be taken up into a context in some obvious sense beyond that which is foreseen by its intrinsic nature, namely the human dining table. But there remains a profound difference between them. Socrates insists that it is properly a sheep that is taken up into this context, that the ulterior, ulterior ends do not intrude on the intrinsic ones in the sense of rendering them simply null. In Spemann's terms, Socrates is, ins is insisting that the nature of the sheep be recollected in our use of it. And note, this recollection does not hamper the use, but liberates it. We would all prefer to eat sheep raised by a shepherd rather than one raised by a butcher, which is why people will pay top dollar for pasture-grazed mutton, right? But there's far more at stake in all of this than a good meal. Socrates introduced the shepherd in order to illustrate a more general point. He aims to make clear that if power, and all human action is in some sense an exercise of power, is not anchored in nature, which thus gives that power a substance, an order, a direction, a horizon, a purpose, it will have no genuine reality, and thus human action will degenerate into empty power play, eruptions of self-seeking without a self and with nothing finally to seek. Socrates and Spemann open up the proper horizon, I think, for an understanding of the place of freedom in Humane Vitae. You thought I forgot about Humane Vitae. <laughs> Allowing us to appreciate both its particular teaching and its broader significance. To the consternation of some, the encyclical introduced the language of the unitive meaning or significance, signi significationem of the conjugal act, beyond the traditional notion of proles as its essential end. But as subsequent discussion has clarified, the inseparability of the unitive and procreative meanings implies that these dimensions are intrinsically related and so not in competition with each other. We've heard that many times. 
to put the terms, sorry, to put the point in the terms we've been using here, the unitive meaning will be properly unitive only to the extent that it recollects the procreative meaning, that is, uh, the natural end that defines the act in its full integrity. It's indeed precisely sexual union that joins the spouses together as one flesh, mediating them to each other in an utterly unique way. What is sexual union? It is the cooperation of what are called the reproductive organs. To intrude upon these organs so as to cancel out their identity as reproductive organs is to produce something other than sexual union. To bring about a union that is only sexual in an accidental sense. In fact, using uh, Adrian Walker's point, you might say you could, to call that sex would be like what Aristotle says about the hand that's been severed from the body. To call it a hand is equivocal. Uh, uh, it looks like one, but it's no longer a hand. I think something similar could be sex said of sex outside of marriage. It will in this case be something else that will be mediating spouses to each other. And so it will not me mediate them to each other precisely as spouses. We see why so much weight is placed in this encyclical on the difference between the natural approach to spacing births and the methods that artificially intervene. The former is recollective of the reproductive meaning even as it lifts the act into a broader context. The latter is simply oblivious of this meaning. And it is so of its very essence. It is analogous to the butcher who masquerades as a shepherd. If we connect this point to the earlier discussion, we begin to see the magnitude of what is at stake here. As we explain, man encounters his nature in a radical way in the encounter of persons that constitute sexual union. So much so that we can say, even as Nietzsche did, that one's relation to sexuality is, in a basic way, reveals who one is. This insight was, of course, deepened by John Paul II, who explained that the divine commandment to love, which is so fundamental to the meaning of existence as to be inscribed into our very flesh, comes to expression in a special way in the conjugal embrace. Moreover, we have proposed that because man is a recapitulation of nature, the union of man and woman concerns not only his nature, but in a certain sense, nature simply. It has cosmological significance. In this respect, the matter addressed in Mani Vitae has not only a moral aspect, but also serves a revelatory purpose. The enactment of freedom within the context of sexuality is willy-nilly a decision regarding the meaning of nature, inescapably. If it is true then that nature plays the role for us that the sacred object played in pre-Christian cultures, namely that of the fixed center that founds the world, the viability of human culture tout court stands or falls with the respect we give or fail to give to the full integrity, integrity of human sexuality. A culture that contracepts will cease before long to be a culture at all. With this, we return to the point with which we started, namely the problem of freedom in the modern world. The essence of freedom reveals itself in a profoundly different way, whether we conceive it as intrinsically or as extrinsically related to nature. A freedom that is recollective of nature, which has its roots in the given form of the natural, reflects the substance of its origin. In this case, nature, in its specificity and determinateness, presents itself not uh, uh, as an extrinsic limit that imposes itself on freedom from the outside and thus constrains it. Instead, nature gives freedom its life's blood. It fills freedom with meaning and purpose and so provides it with an essential energy that allows it to flourish. It makes freedom real. Just as a plant is not constrained by the soil in which it is planted. For the soil, though it sets and holds the plant in a particular place, is the very condition for the plant's growth, its movement beyond. It transcends because it's planted, because it's rooted. So too is nature the condition for freedom's transcendence. Man and woman are drawn together by nature. This inclination does not intrude on their freedom, but gives it momentum, and also a goal that allows their freedom to be meaningful. Though nature inf uh, does indeed present a limitation, as V.S. points out, this limitation I want to suggest, is the fixed center that allows the existence of the spouses to unfold in a genuinely human way. It constitutes the household as a cosmos, that is, as a properly ordered world. To subject the nature of marriage to freedom is to undermine freedom. To allow freedom 
to undermine itself. When the church thus insists on exceptionless moral norms, when she remains steadfast in her condemnation of contraception in a manner that makes her appear ridiculous in the eyes of those who seek anxiously to come to some reasonable compromise with the spirit of modernity, she is actually clinging heroically to the very principle of human freedom. Christ came not to condemn the world, but to give it life, life in abundance. And the encyclical that we celebrate today is the seal of the church's fidelity to this pro-life mission. Thank you. <laughs>